Frequency Matters, the RF and Microwave Update Series. I'm Pat Hindle. I'm here with my co-host Gary LaRude. In this episode, we're going to take a quick look at our 5G IoT November issue. The cover story is about a new antenna design for 5G millimeter wave handsets and mobile devices, and it's an external antenna that can hook up to any millimeter wave module. The current millimeter wave modules have patch antennas integrated into the packaging, whereas this one's an external antenna, so it gives you more gain. So it could be a future uh, improvement on 5G millimeter wave designs. So what do we have for other technical features? Well, we have a couple other antenna articles. These are more focused on the base station. The first is a CBRS uh, beam steering antenna at 3.6 gigahertz written by Menlo Micro. And it's interesting because they use their MEM switch as part of the phase shifting network. And then we have an article from the Lebanese University and the Polytechnic University of Valencia that talks about a dual band antenna for digital beam forming. This one that works for LTE as well as 5G. Then Keysight Technologies has submitted a special report talking about how 5G is enabling the industry 4.0 as we call it. And then our fabs and labs this month, we visit the new NXP GAN wafer fab in Chandler, Arizona. They are ramping now into production six inch wafers for the base station infrastructure market. Yeah, that was interesting development that they're a uh, new fab in the US for once. Yes. Turning to the news, I wanted to highlight a few interesting products that we've come across. The first is from PSEMI, it's their PE 43614 digital step attenuator, and it goes up to 45 gigahertz. So this mm. is great for 5G millimeter wave test and measurement applications. And it also goes all the way down to nine kilohertz. So the step sizes can be programmed in half dB and one dB increments over the full 31.5 dB total attenuation range. Mm. And that's monotonic over all the frequency ranges. The attenuator also offers glitch-free switching between transitions, so there's no power spikes that would interrupt other sensitive circuitry. And they also have an additional model that's 9 kilohertz to 13 gigahertz for point-to-point -point communications and uh, VSAT applications. So they have both offerings, and you can find out more about those at RFMW, who's a distributor for PSEMI. I like your right. t-shirt. Thank you. I also wanted to highlight Teledyne E2V, who had a briefing with me. And they are sampling the first direct microwave synthesis DAC, which has 26 gigahertz output. This wide output data 12-bit data converter can deal with sample rates up to 12 gigabits per second, and it has the capacity to generate multiple waveforms at the same time, so a very interesting product. They're also working on an ADC product that can go with this for a full transceiver, so it'll be very interesting mm. to check that out when it's available. Yeah, exactly. And finally, I wanted to highlight HRL scientists had developed a new GAN device. This is a W-band nitrogen polar GAN low noise amplifier, and it'll be the first device of its kind. It offers up to four times the output at W-band of the current HRL processes. So very interesting to see applications in EW, radar, and communications. Yeah, it would be very interesting to see how that gets commercialized. What did you see in the news? Well, we've had uh, earnings releases from Corvo and Skyworks, and both of them have uh, had outstanding quarters. A uh, lot of growth where their uh, actual results were above their guidance. They're seeing very strong take, of course, in the mobile market with 5G phones. The iPhone is out now. Also strong demand in China, as well as their broad markets are doing well, uh, principally in Wi-Fi and some of the applications of Wi-Fi. Then we had a couple of announcements from Corvo associated with their earnings release. They have acquired an interesting company called Seven Hugs Labs. I like that name. Which is a 35 person software development team that's working on ultra wide band. And this is a complement to the DecaWave acquisition that they did last February. So it seems like the mobile products business is really focusing on ultra wide band, which they see will be resident in the smartphone and just provide a lot of interesting applications like keyless entry into the car. And then on the other side of the house, the infrastructure and defense products business, they just recently received a government contract up to potentially $75 million wow. that will help them do a new prototype and production packaging facility at their Richardson, Texas facility. So I think it's a reflection that the government is looking for trusted sources for electronic components, as we know from our conversation with Mercury Systems. Yes. So uh, turning to the news, the European Microwave Association announced that European Microwave Week 2020 is going virtual. No surprises there. Uh, they had planned to have it in the fall. They moved it to mid-January to try to avoid COVID-19, but there's no way we're having in-person events in the near future in right. the U.S. or Europe. They did it enough in advance that everybody can prepare for it. 
So both on the exhibition side and, and attendee side, everybody can prepare for that mid-January uh, go date. What's good is they're going to keep the normal time frame of January 10 to 15 and the time slots for the Netherlands time zone. So the schedule is unchanged for the sessions. They're also offering discounts if you do multiple conferences, so that's a good thing for attendees. And these sessions will be on demand for three weeks after, so that's one thing good about a virtual event. Right. And I do really like what they're doing with the exhibition. They're going to actually recreate some of the larger stands in 3D to the CAD drawings that they were actually going to use for the physical event. And there'll be a whole host of ways to interact with the exhibitors. There's text and there's audio and video conversations you can have. You can watch videos or download PDF information from each exhibitor. And they also have categorized them all by product type. So if you're interested in a certain product, you can click on that and get the exhibitors that just offer that product. So I think it'll be much better than some of the previous uh, virtual events that we've seen. It might be kind of a benchmark going forward for other shows. So we'll see how it works out. Yeah, the functionality sounds really good. I also want to remind everybody that we're doing virtual panels. The first one is December 8th on Open RAN. And we have Joe Madden of Mobile Experts moderating. And we have experts from Keysight, Qualcomm, ADI, Xilinx, and Viavi. So wow. quite the lineup of uh, experts there. And then we'll have another one on the evolution of the RF front end on January 21st. So if anybody is interested in the evolution of the RF front end, being an expert, please contact me. Yeah, you did a great job recruiting people for that forum. And now we're less than a week away from our Power Amplifier Design Forum, which will be held on Tuesday, November 17th. It's a full day event. We have six outstanding speakers lined up who are going to cover topics as varied as uh, Class F power amplifier design to stability analysis to the effect of load mismatch to modeling and so forth. So we invite our uh, viewers to register for that. They can find information and do the registration at the Microwave Journal website. Just look for the events tab and then you can register. And even if you can't attend the event live next Tuesday, you can watch on demand because all the events will be recorded. Yep. So it's a, it's a great event. I'm looking forward to it. And I think that wraps up this episode of uh, Frequency Matters. We want to thank our sponsors, Wireless Telecom Group. They are the parent of Booten, Holsworth, and Noisecom, as well as Com Agility and Microlab. And our other sponsor this week is RFMW, a pure play technical RF microwave distributor. And in honor of them, I'm wearing their t-shirt from the uh, Whiskey a no-go event that unfortunately did not happen. I was looking forward to that. I know. Every year they have a, uh, an event and they have the X-Band pickup band, but unfortunately it didn't happen this year. But we appreciate them remembering us with the t-shirt nonetheless. So thanks everyone for watching and please be safe out there.